Alrighty guys, hi, it is Jubilee, and I'm here again for another TA review. Um, this time, what we're going to be going over is stuff for y'all's midterm that you have coming up. Um, so there are going to be two videos um, in this kind of series to review for your midterm. Um, this first one, I'm going to be going over kind of the format of the exam, and then I'm also going to be going over kind of like a Jeopardy review. Um, and that is posted on eCampus, so you guys can go through it, um, save the images, and, and take notes on it or anything like that. Um, but I am going to be kind of covering more than just what it says. I'm just going to be adding in, you know, little bits of information that I think are important as we go through these slides. So just be sure to pay attention, um, try to take notes, and just try to learn um, as much as you can from that. And then for our second video, what we're going to be doing is I'm going to be going over um, some pretty important images to study. Um, and what I will tell you guys is you know those images a lot of them have arrows on them and stuff like that um, so you will probably recognize that they look like they came straight from a question right um, that is because they did so if you guys watch that video um, hopefully a lot of those images will look really familiar when you're taking your midterm um, this next upcoming week okay um, so that's my advice to you guys is just to you know, really try to study and watch these videos. Um, I am going to be covering, you know, some of the main points, the things that I think you guys really need to be focusing on. Um, and I will tell you, because I know you guys are stressing out about it, this exam, I will tell you the questions on the midterm are not as nitpicky as the questions you guys have been having on your quizzes. Okay. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about how I made the exam. So how I made the exam was I took a lot of the questions from you guys' quizzes that I think were more big picture, okay? So not as specific or nitpicky. Um, there aren't very many nitpicky, um, in my opinion, there aren't any nitpicky questions, but in my opinion, um, a lot of the questions that are on the exam are going to be mainly identification of cells or of tissues, um, as well as their main functions, and then a lot of the questions are going to be, you know, um, about the big overall function of a system, okay? Um, and they are pulled from those quizzes, so if you go look back at those quiz banks, that's a great way to practice. Um, but I would tell you, don't worry about the ones that are super nitpicky and stress out about those. I would focus on the ones that are about identification of big important things we covered or about big overall functions um, and concepts from the system, okay? Um, and then I will also tell you, you know, and hopefully you guys have learned this, there are multiple versions of every question, right? And so a lot of what I did on the midterm was I took the same picture or the same general question and I just changed it a little bit, okay, to where it changes the answer. So I changed the wording. So I will tell you guys, when you're taking your exam, read very carefully, Okay, read very carefully. Don't just assume because you've seen this question before that the answer is going to be all of the above because it was the last time you saw that question. Um, you know, some of them are going to be different and changed a little bit. So you do really need to pay attention to the question and not just go on autopilot and assume that you know the answer. Okay, so you do actually have to know what it's asking of you. All right, um, so I will go over the test format. Um, so it is going to be 55 questions and you'll have the whole class period to do that. So that's an hour and 15 minutes to do all of those. Um, and if you'll look in your syllabus, your midterm is worth 325 out of the thousand total points for your grade, right? So that's a lot. That's 32 and a half percent of your final grade, okay? Um, but that is why we've been giving you guys so much extra credit over this um, semester. So hopefully that will help cushion you. Another thing that we've done is we've given you extra credit on the midterm, okay? So there's 55 questions. Um, I think they're worth like seven points each or something like that. Um, and so you have a total of 385 points that you can score on the midterm. So if you get all of the questions correct, you can get a 385 and we will only take that out of 325, okay? Meaning you can get above a 100 on this exam. Okay, so we've given you more points possible than what we're going to count the midterm out of. Okay, and then this is going to be the breakdown 
of the exam and it will be like your quizzes so they will be pulled from a larger question bank so for every one of these topics that's going to be covered on your exam there will be a question of about 15 a pool of about 15 questions um, and the questions that you get on your midterm will be pulled from that okay so not everybody's going to get the exact same questions on their midterm um, and yeah <laughs> not everybody's going to get the exact same questions on the midterm um, but they will be very similar and so some of you guys will see the same ones again um, and stuff like that okay so when I'm covering this stuff in the midterm I'm trying to cover all of the question banks all of the questions so obviously that's very hard for me to do because I can't guarantee if I cover something you're going to get the question that covers that um, but just uh, you know do your best try to study everything that I'm pointing out um, and you should be good Okay, so this is going to be the breakdown. So there's going to be five questions on intro to microscopy, six covering epithelium, um, five on connective tissue, five cartilage and bone, peripheral nerve, six on muscle, right? So y'all can read that. Um, six on lymphoid. And then the guaranteed question pool is basically just at the end. So that's kind of where your extra credit comes from for this um, exam. How it's out of 385 instead of 325 is... Um, there's a guaranteed question pool, which basically means there's nine questions, one on each one of these topics, and they are kind of easier because I made them and I make questions easier for you guys. Um, so they are kind of easier, uh, more straightforward questions. There's even more than the rest of your midterm, which I think is pretty straightforward and easy. So there's nine of them and you will get seven of those. Okay, so um, the reason it's called the guaranteed questions is because you have a really high chance of getting those questions, um, whereas these you have about like, a, you know, a five out of 15. So one third chance of getting each of those questions for this one, you're going to get all but two of them. Okay, so that's why I've made them easier, a little more straightforward. It is to try to help you guys out, help you guys get more of those um, points. Okay. Um, so the kind of way that the exam will look is um, it'll be like normal where you'll only be able to see one question at a time, but we will let you backtrack. Okay, so that's different than your quizzes where once you submit it, you can't go back. We will let you backtrack so you can go back and forth between the questions. Um, it will let you see which ones you haven't answered and stuff like that. So you, you can um, click on the overall thing and it'll show you which questions you know where you are in the grand scheme of things and which questions you haven't answered so you can go back and look at them um you won't be allowed you know a paper pen anything like that um and then you know it's obviously closed note okay so you are going to have to actually know some of this stuff but um keep in mind that is why i made these questions more straightforward okay because i really just want you guys to learn so this is more of a test of you know everything you've learned not how well you can look up um, notes and, and remember nitpicky details okay um and then um this semester it will be proctored via zoom okay um and i did send out an email with all of the instructions to that so please read that um, and just make sure that you're prepared for when it is your test time just the so that there are no surprises or anything and we don't have um, any issues and you're not stressed out before you're trying to take your exam, okay? But it will be via Zoom. Um, you'll need a second device, so like your phone, another tablet, something like that. You can borrow a friend's laptop um, if you have issues with that. Uh, but we'll, we'll need you to point it towards yourself, your workstation, and your um, device that you're taking the test on so that we can monitor the test, okay? And that is to ensure academic honesty, okay? All right, so I'll go ahead and we'll start the midterm review. Um, so this is gonna be the first one. It's kind of like a Jeopardy. Um, and you know, normally I do it with you guys and stuff like that, but we'll just go through the slides. And as we're going through it, I am gonna point out, you know, more than just what the question's asking and some, some important points about the concepts that we're covering uh, for you guys to remember, okay? So we'll start with microscopy and cell function. So this is kind of like our intro to microscopy um, category. So what is living substance known as? Okay, um, so hopefully you guys remember that is gonna be protoplasm. Um, so remember that was that, you know, kind of definition that um, 
I told you guys it's easy to forget and not remember just because it is so straightforward. So remember, protoplasm is just any kind of living substance, right? And then remember that breakdown. If you get enough living substance together, you can make a cell. It's the smallest unit of protoplasm. You get enough of those together, you can make a tissue. Enough tissues together, you can make an organ. Organs can make an organ system, and then you get a whole organism, right? So just remember those um, kind of definitions and stuff and how, how we break that down. Okay, it's pretty straightforward, but just make sure you, um, you know, don't forget it because it is so straightforward. All right. So next one, what type of stain is this? Um, so hopefully you can recognize, you know, it's got this kind of magenta -y purple part, um, and it is staining these very sugar-rich places in the cell. So hopefully you recognize this is a periodic acid shift stain. Um, right, so remember we went over all the different stains and we want you to be able to recognize them. Um, so make sure you recognize the other two types of stains that we covered, right? So there's hematoxylin and eosin, that's that H&E stain, that's hopefully the one that you guys are pretty used to by now, it's the pinky purpley one. Um, and I do need you to know, you know, what each of these compounds stains, right? So remember hematoxylin is going to be the, the one that stains nucleic acids blue. Eosin is going to be the one that stains proteins red, right? So make sure you remember that. Um, and then the next one, periodic acid shift. So that's the one that we just saw. That's the one with the very magenta y purpley color. And remember that what it's staining for are carbohydrates, right? So sugar rich places are going to stain that very bright magenta -y purple color. Toludinin blue is going to be the last one that we learned about. Um, and so, you know, just remember um, everything's blue. And the varying in the um, intensity of the stain is going to be varied by the densities of the tissues. Okay, so just make sure that you remember that those kind of um, definitions and everything like that uh, for these different stains. Okay, so what type of EM microscopy is this? Um, so this is the one that kind of looks like everything you guys are used to, right? This is kind of what you'll expect when you look at an EM. So this is conventional um, electron microscopy, right? Conventional electron microscopy. Um, so that is the one that's very flat, very 2D, right? There's not very much um, three-dimensional kind of detail that you guys can see with them. And that is the one that you guys are used to. It's the one that's the most common. Right? But then remember, we do have these two other types, so that's going to be scanning electron microscopy. It looks like you kind of took a picture of it, you scanned it in. Um, so it does look kind of very three-dimensional. And then carbon replica um, transmission electron microscopy, remember that's the one where we're like making a Play-Doh mold. Okay, So it tells you a lot about the surface of the... Um, tissue that we're looking at, uh, but it does kind of look like we made a replica of this, right? Like we made a cast of the tissue and we're just looking at the, the Play-Doh or the, the carbon replica that we've made. Okay. Explain the difference between magnification and resolution. So hopefully you guys um, are good at this. So remember, magnification is going to be an increase in image size, so just making things bigger. Resolution is going to be the smallest, smallest distinguishable distance between two points, right? So that means if we um, increase the magnification, we make it bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, eventually you're not going to be able to tell the difference um, between this point and this point, right? Unless we increase the resolution, then you can tell the difference between two points, right? Um, so it's kind of like that thing we were talking about how on a railroad track, the further down you look on the railroad track, the less you can tell that there are two separate um, tracks that um, are side by side with each other, right? It kind of all looks the same. That's because the resolution's decreasing. So you can't really tell the difference between those two points, right? So in order to do that, we need to increase the resolution. Magnification is just making things bigger. Okay, this one, what is a fibroblast? So, um, hopefully you can identify all these fibroblasts in here, right? So this is dense, irregular, connective tissue, right? Um, and so what a fibroblast is, is it is a collagen-producing cell of the connective tissue, right? So what it does is you've got a bunch of fibroblasts in here, and they're making all of this pink stuff, all of this pink stuff. 
Remember, pink is protein. Um, this specific protein we know is collagen. Okay, so it's making this collagen, this really tough um, fiber in here. And um, a really important thing for you guys to understand is that it's making that extracellularly, right? So this is not a part of any cell. This is not within the cytoplasm of any cell. This is just collagen in the extracellular matrix, extracellular matrix, right? So these fibroblasts are just putting out all of this collagen, all of these little collagen bundles to help connect this tissue together, right? To help connect to all of these blood vessels, these little sweat ducts, everything down together um, to make it uh, stable, okay? And so this is dense irregular connective tissue uh, because all of the collagen bundles are going off in different directions and stuff like that, right? And there's a ton of collagen packed all throughout here, right? There's a ton of that pink protein collagen all throughout here in between these little fibroblasts that are making all of that. Okay, what type of tissue is this specifically? Um, so hopefully you guys realize this is fat. This is white fat right? Or adipose tissue. So this is that stuff that looks like chicken wire, right? It looks like a bunch of little chicken wire links in a fence that you're making, right? Um, so this is white fat or adipose tissue, okay? And so what it is is there's a bunch of collagen around here, connective tissue, connecting all of these um, fat cells. And so in here is the actual fat cell, the actual um, fat. It just doesn't stain well, right so it just doesn't pick up any stain so it looks like it's empty but I promise there is fat being stored in here um, and that's why it has this kind of chicken wire appearance okay and there's all this um, loose irregular connective tissue around it okay all right so this one what type of cartilage is this so hopefully you guys recognize this is hyaline cartilage Okay. This is hyaline cartilage. Um, it is that kind of very characteristic purpley color. Um, and, you know, it, it has these little lacunae in here. Remember these little cocoons? And in those lacunae are those chondrocytes. Chondrocyte means cartilage cell, right? So all these little lacunae with chondrocytes in here. Um, and remember, so your hyaline cartilage is in places like your trachea right it's in it's in your nose as well um, it's on the ends of your bones right that's what forms your joints and remember hyaline cartilage is the type of cartilage that provides that embryonic blueprint for your bones right so when you're forming as a fetus um, your the fetus lays down all this hyaline cartilage that provides the blueprint for bones the blueprint for bones and that eventually gets replaced by bone um, to form your actual bones right and then the hyaline cartilage remains on the ends of those bones to form those joints okay um, and remember that process that we're talking about the replacement of cartilage by bone is going to be that endochondrial ossification okay that is how bone grows in length okay um, because bone in itself cannot grow in length it cannot undergo interstitial growth interstitial growth is growth in length by itself in order to do that the cartilage has to grow in length first and then the cartilage just gets replaced by bone okay so some of you guys in um found that out on your on your quizzes and got a little confused by that cartilage can undergo interstitial growth meaning growth in length and appositional growth growth in width bone cannot it can only undergo appositional growth which is growth in width if it wants to grow um, interstitially as in in length it wants to get taller the only way you can get taller is by first putting down cartilage okay and then replacing it by bone that is why once your growth end plates have closed up right there's no more cartilage that's dividing in your bones you cannot get any taller right that's why um, you know, you have growth spurts and things like that. And then once you're done with puberty, once those growth plates have closed, you cannot grow in length anymore. You're done growing. Okay, you can't get any taller. Okay, um, so yeah, that was hyaline cartilage. And then note the perichondrium. So remember, this is all um, cartilage, right? Hyaline cartilage. And remember, we said perichondrium. Perichondrium means around the cartilage. So that's what we're referring to when we're talking about all this connective tissue. 
So this is connective tissue that's surrounding the cartilage, peri meaning around. So this is all perichondrium right here. And this is in the trachea, so you can see, you know, there's some veins in here, um, blood vessels and stuff, and then this is actually that respiratory epithelium right there, um, lining the inside of the trachea. Okay. Okay, what is this structure known as? Um, so hopefully you guys at least recognize, you know, what tissue you're in, right? So this is in bone, this is in um, hard bone, right? So your compact bone. Um, and so remember we said in compact bone, um, that osteoid, right, that, that minerally um, matrix in your bone is so dense and so hard that blood cannot, cannot actually diffuse through it, right? It can diffuse through your soft tissues and that's how you get nutrients from your blood vessels, but it cannot diffuse through hard bone. And so that's why we have this whole complicated system. Um, it's called the Haversion system, right? Haversion system, hopefully you remember that. Um, and so these things right here in the center, these kind of big holes in the center of each of these big tree trunk rings, each of these Haversion um, systems is going to be the Haversion canal, right? So these are the Haversion canals. This is what um, blood goes through, right? So blood will be running through these Haversion canals and we need to get that blood to go all the way from inside here to the outside, okay? from the inside to the outside. And so that's why we have this whole haversion system, okay, is to get blood to go through here. Because normally if you have a blood vessel through here and a bunch of soft tissue, the blood can just diffuse to out here. In this compact bone, it cannot. So in order to allow it to, we have um, this haversion system. So we've got these spider-like looking black lines. Try and remember what those are. Hopefully you remember those are canaliculi, so these spider-like kind of looking black lines, those are canaliculi, so they're like little channels that go from this um, inside central haversion canal out to this little space. This space is called a lacunae. In the lacunae, so the lacunae is like a little cocoon, it's this little space. In this little space, this lacunae is an osteocyte, right, meaning bone cell an osteocyte. And so that osteocyte is just chilling in here, maintaining the bone matrix around it, but we need to keep it alive, right? In order to keep it alive, we need it to get blood. So it gets blood from the central haversion canal. It travels through these canaliculi um, into this lacunae, and then it can travel through these canaliculi to the next lacunae, right? To the next, so that all of these osteocytes can get blood and nutrients. Okay, so that's a haversion canal. Okay, what zone is this called? Um, so this is what we were talking about, right? This whole process is called that endochondrial ossification, right? That's the formation from cartilage into bone. So this happens, you know, when um, you're a fetus and we're trying to turn that hyaline blueprint into bone. It also happens at your um, growth plates, right? Your growth plates. So that's how you get taller, right? Is first we lay down cartilage and then we replace it with bone. So... Um, we're going to identify this zone right here, um, and the way I remember it is real people have careers, okay? And so this zone right here, you can see there, there's all these little chondrocytes and they're starting to stack up, right? They're starting to stack up in neat little lines. They're trying to orient themselves, get serious, get things figured out. So this is the zone of proliferation, okay? zone of proliferation. So this is where they're starting to divide. They make these neat little rows um, and that's that zone. Okay. Hopefully you can recognize these other zones. So this one right here before they're organized, this is going to be the zone of reserve. Zone of reserve. So this is where they're all unorganized. They're just out here. They're, they're just kind of chilling, right? They haven't really gotten serious about turning into bone yet. So they're just chilling up here. Once they start to get organized and stack up like this, this is that zone of proliferation. Okay. Eventually, they start to swell up. So you see how they start to get bigger. Um, their little lacunas are taking up more space. So they're bigger now, um, and they're they're starting to swell up. That's our zone zone of hypertrophy. Hypertrophy. Okay. Um, that's our zone of hypertrophy. And then once they've done that, they actually die off. They get replaced by bone. The cartilage gets eaten up by osteocytes and replaced by bone, um, and that's our zone of calcification. So real people have careers, 
um, zone of reserve, proliferation, hypertrophy, calcification. Okay. Um, so remember that. Let's see. Um, what is the name and function of this cell? So hopefully you recognize we are, oh no, hopefully you recognize we're in the spongy bone, right? So we're in the bone, um, there's some bone marrow down here, right? So I don't need you to identify all of these cells. Uh, most of them are gonna be hematopoietic cells, but this one right here, I do need you guys to recognize. Um, so you can see it, it, it looks like it's maybe five or six cells all clumped together, right? And really what it is, is it's one large cell with multiple nuclei, right? And remember the cell that we said is one large cell with multiple nuclei is gonna be an osteoclast, right? An osteoclast, and remember osteoclasts catalyze bone, so they break down bone and cartilage, okay? They break down bone and cartilage, so that's an osteoclast. Um, the only time your osteoclasts break down cartilage is, you know, when they're replacing it with bone. They don't normally do that, um, but they can break down cartilage when, when they need to, okay? So this is an osteoclast. And then remember, um, we've got other cells that we need to be able to identify in here. Um, so this pink stuff, remember this pink stuff is osteoid, osteoid. So that's just that extracellular matrix, that tough um, part of the bone that makes your bones hard osteoid. These right here, hopefully you realize these are osteocytes, right? Because osteocytes chill. They chill in the bone. They chill in the bone, so they're in their little lacunae. They're just maintaining the matrix around them. They're pretty metabolically inactive. They're not really doing much in here, okay? And then these cells right here that line up on the side of the osteoid, they're lining up on the side of the osteoid, Hopefully you recognize those are osteoblasts, osteoblasts. And osteoblasts build bone, right? Blasts build. So they lay down new bone. So that's why they're lining up on the side of this osteoid. Um, they're laying down new bone. And eventually they'll lay down so much bone that they'll trap themselves in osteoid. Okay, so it's kind of like painting yourself in a corner, right? They're building so much osteoid around themselves that they get trapped. That's when they become an osteocyte, okay? They become metabolically inactive and they just start to chill, so they convert themselves to an osteocyte, okay? So just remember all of that. Okay, what type of epithelium is this? So remember all your different types of epithelium, right? And how we're gonna categorize this. So how we're gonna categorize this first is we're going to look at the top layer of cells and decide what kind of shape we think they're in, right? And so to me, these look very flat, very squished, right? Especially that one, you can't really see the cytoplasm. You can only really see the nucleus. They're starting to get more flat and more squished as we go towards the surface. So that is gonna be squamous, squamous epithelium, right? And we don't categorize it based on the cells down here, right? Only the cells at the top, so squamous. And then we're gonna look at how many layers, right? So it looks like there's multiple, multiple layers in here. And the term we're going to use for that is gonna be stratified. So this is stratified squamous epithelium. Um, more specifically, this is a non-keratinized epithelium, okay? We're gonna learn a little more about this when we cover skin, so um, don't stress out about that too much. Um, just know that you know, your normal skin that you have um, on the outside, your fingernails, um, your normal skin is going to be keratinized. That's what makes it hard and tough. Um, but in places like your tongue, um, your eyes, stuff like that, um, the, the skin on there is going to be non-keratinized, okay? Um, and that's why it is softer and stuff, okay? Um, but yeah, so just remember your different classifications, how we classify epithelium, um, and be able to, to do that. Okay, um, some other things I'll point out, right? There's some little blood vessels in here. These are some little um, venules in here, right? And I know they're venules because they're not very circular. Um, they're kind of squished all around. Okay, ones like these you, you might be able to say are an arterial or something because they are more circular, right? But when they're not very circular and they're squished, we definitely know they're a venule. Um, and we've got some generic connected tissue down here, right? So these are going to be fibroblasts down here. Okay. 
chromosome or epithelium, sweat ducts are characterized by, right? And remember we said um, sweat ducts are pretty much always going to be this specific type of epithelium, or they are always going to be. Um, and so these are going to be the sweat ducts, right? These hot pink ones, they look much more pink um, than the rest of the tissue. So right here, right here, right here. These are going to be your sweat ducts. Oh, I ruined it. Oh, well. Um, so that's going to be your stratified, or yeah, stratified cuboidal epithelium. Okay, um, so it's more than one layer of cube-like cells. Um, you know, they're obviously not perfect squares or everything, but they're definitely not as flat and as squished as the epithelium that lines your vessels, right? So this is very flat and squished. These are more bubbly, right? There's more cytoplasm to it. So that's going to be in your sweat ducts, right? Um, so if you see a sweat duct, you know it's going to be stratified cuboidal, okay? Um, these are your sweat glands right here, right? We've got some of this chicken wire, right? So that's going to be adipose tissue. Um, we've got a bunch of connective tissue, right? So we've got some fibroblasts in here, um, a bunch of sweat glands. We've got a bunch of lymph vessels. I know it's a lymph vessel because it's got this kind of light pink lymph inside it, right? Light pink lymph inside it. So there's a lymph vessel. Um, we've got some little maybe arterioles because they're more circular arterioles um, and so another thing um, how I know these are you know these are fat cells not um, little veins or venules is because there's no endothelium around them right there's no cells little endothelial cells surrounding them um, if it was a venule um, or a little blood vessel it would have these little endothelial cells surrounding them okay so you can see the little nuclei of those cells right there that's how I know it's a vessel, not white fat. Okay, so stratified cuboidal epithelium. The tracheal lumen has what type of epithelial tissue? Okay, so we did look at the trachea earlier. Remember, the trachea is going to be covered by respiratory epithelium, and respiratory epithelium is this very special type of um, epithelium that we learned about. Okay. So it is going to be pseudostratified columnar epithelium. Okay, um, Specifically, it's ciliated pseudostratified columnar epithelium. But remember, when we learned about epithelium, so the pseudostratified means falsely stratified, right? So it looks like there's more than one layer here, but there's not. Okay, Every single one of these cells will touch the base, will touch the base. So it's only one layer thick. Okay, It's just hard to see. So that's why it's tricky. That's why it's pseudo stratified um, because it looks like there's more than one layer but there's not and they are column like in shape especially at the top right so they're very column like so it's pseudo stratified columnar epithelium and then there are these little cilia at the top okay so this is very characteristic of respiratory epithelium um, some more things so you've got you know you can see all the connective tissue down here you've got a bunch of plasma cells right here these kind of fried egg looking cells are plasma cells um, and remember, those produce antibodies. Okay, so what type of muscle is this? Um, oh, what is this and what type of muscle does it characterize? Um, so this is obviously muscle and you can see, you know, all these little striations in here, right? So this is striated muscle. And what this is right here is this is connecting these two cells together, right? Same as this, same as this, right? So what these are are intercalated discs, right? Intercalated discs. And remember, this is very characteristic of cardiac muscle, right? Cardiac muscle, because we want all these cells to contract at the same time. So this is how they talk to each other, is they have these very special intercalated discs that connect them to each other. Okay, so just remember all your different types of muscle, the different characteristics of each muscle, right? So if we see cardiac muscle, we expect those cells to be mononucleate, we expect them to be striated, um, and we expect them to be branched, right? Because they're connecting to each other and they have those intercalated discs. Okay. In muscle, actin and myosin are arranged in repeating units known as a sarcomere, right? A sarcomere. So that's the, the repeatable unit in striated muscle. Right, so in um, 
skeletal and cardiac muscle, your actin and myosin are going to arrange themselves in regular repeating units known as a sarcomere. Um, I will tell you guys on your midterm, I won't ask you all the nitty gritty details about a sarcomere. The main thing I need you to know um, is obviously this definition that it's the repeating unit in your striated muscle. Um, and then I need you to know, you know, that in um, A band, is going to be the dark band and I band is going to be the light band. Um, the dividing line between where a sarcomere ends and begins is going to be the Z disc or Z line. But as far as things like the H band, everything like that, um, I won't ask you guys too many details about that. Okay, so don't don't worry about um, all the details of a sarcomere and stuff like that. Okay. So what is the name of this layer? Um, so this is an artery, okay? This is an elastic artery. And remember, we've got these three layers. So we've got this innermost layer, this kind of middle layer, and then this outermost layer. So this medium kind of layer is gonna be the tunica media, right? Tunica media, okay? This is gonna be the tunica intima right here um, with the endothelium and everything, the elastic internal elastic lamina. It's going to be the tunica media right here with a lot of your smooth muscle um, and some more elastic fibers. And then this is going to be the tunica adventitia. That's going to be the connective tissue that anchors it down um, to the surrounding tissue. Okay, so just remember those three main layers. Okay, what is the network of small blood vessels that supply larger vessels called? Okay, so basically what this is talking about is sometimes you have blood vessels that are so big, right? They're so big that the tissue surrounding the blood vessel is so thick that it actually needs its own vessels. It needs its own vessels in the surrounding tissue, okay? Um, and so that's going to be mainly in places like your heart, right? So your heart is kind of one big vessel, but it needs its own vessels, Right? It, it needs its own vessels to supply all of that tissue because it's just so thick. Um, and so those are going to be called vasa vasorum, right? So that means vessel of other vessels, right? So it's a vessel of vessels. Um, and that's just because some of those vessels are going to be so big that um, they, they actually can't supply all of the blood to the tissue around them. So they need their own vessels, vasa vasorum. What type of capillaries do the testes have? Um, and so remember when we talked about the different types of capillaries, we have continuous capillaries, fenestrated capillaries, and then sinusoidal capillaries. And remember they vary based on how much blood or how much um, stuff in the blood they're going to allow through, right? So continuous is gonna allow the least amount through Fenestrated is going to allow some stuff through, but it's not going to allow, you know, red blood cells and, and whole blood and stuff like that. And then sinusoidal will. Sinusoidal has big gaping holes in it, okay? So in places like the testes, we have things like the blood testis barrier, right? So that means we don't want to allow things through. So we're going to need our most, our most um, selective and protective type of capillary, um, the continuous capillaries okay so they allow very little through mainly just oxygen and, and nutrients and stuff like that um, pretty much nothing else okay and so that's also going to be in places like your skeletal muscle your brain and your thymus so that's where we have um, kind of like a blood barrier right a blood muscle barrier blood brain barrier blood thymus barrier um, so that's where we're going to have our continuous capillaries Okay, what cell is this? Um, so this is an EM, and this is an EM of a white blood cell. Um, so hopefully you guys can identify this. So a hint that I'll give you is to look in these granules, right? This specific granule um, is very characteristic of this type of cell. So this type of um, white blood cell has, a crisp, has crystalline core granules, okay? Crystalline core granules. And what I mean by that is within this one granule, there's two different kind of colors, right? There's two different shades within here, um, meaning that there's varying densities and stuff within these granules, right? Because it has like a crystalline core. It has something within that granule that makes it a different um, density, 
within here. Okay, and that's very characteristic of an eosinophil. Okay, so just remember the way that we um, identify all these different white blood cells. The thing that's very characteristic for eosinophils are crystalline core granules. Okay. And then this one right here, what cell is this and what are they the precursor to? So this is another EM of a white blood cell because I know this is tricky for you guys. Um, so what cell is this? Um, hopefully you can see on the um, cell membrane, you can appreciate how there are these little projections coming off, right? They look like little arm-like projections branching off of this cell. And so that is very characteristic of the white blood cell, the monocyte. Right, monocyte, and that is because they are precursors to macrophages. Right, macrophages. So those are our phagocytic cells. Right, and in order to phagocytize things, they need to be able to branch out to grab a hold of something and bring it back in. So they have these very um, prominent arm-like projections coming off of their cell membrane um, to help them grab things. Okay, so that's how I know this is a monocyte precursor to a macrophage. Okay, so now we're on the lymph and nervous system, so name the two primary lymphoid organs. And remember when I say primary, primary means, um, you know, they're, they're producing the white blood cells that we need for the immune system, um, not utilizing them. So they're making them, they're the little factories that um, develop them into mature white blood cells. Um, and so they are antigen independent, right? And that means that we do not need nor do we want antigens in these organs, right? We do not want any antigens, any bad guys, germs, stuff like that within these organs because remember we're still making them, we're still forming them, and so they're still learning what's good. So if we put bad stuff in there, they're going to think that those um, bad antigens are a part of you. And so if they're a part of you, then they're not going to attack them right? So we don't want antigens um, when they're in this formative stage. And so the two organs that are responsible for that are going to be the thymus and the bone marrow, okay? And remember the thymus makes your T cells, um, or at least is responsible for developing your T cells, and the bone marrow is responsible for developing your B cells and maturing them. Okay, what is this? Um, so we're in the skin, right? You've got all of this um, keratinized, stratified squamous epithelium, right? You've got all of this dense, irregular connective tissue down here. And then right here, um, at this kind of interface, as close as it can get to your skin is this little kind of nerve receptor, okay? So hopefully you remember the name of this. This is a mycinor's corpuscle a mycinor's corpuscle. And remember, these are those receptors that are responsible for light touch, right? So if somebody's brushing up on um, your arm or something like that very lightly, you can feel it with your mycinor's corpuscle, okay? So responsible for light touch. And that's why it's as close to the skin as it can get, because um, it's for light touch. And hopefully you remember the ones that are way deeper down in your skin, the ones that look like onion rings, look like a bunch of onion rings, a bunch of circles um, with a bunch of layers. Those are going to be responsible for your deep touch, so pressure, right? If, if you squeeze down on your arm, that's going to trigger your pers your pacinian corpuscles, pacinian corpuscles, okay? And those are going to be responsible for deep touch. These ones are mycinor's corpuscles. And remember, that's different from the mycinor's plexus, right? So mycinor's corpuscles are in your skin. Mycinor's plexus, that was in your digestive system, okay? Um, and those, it's just, you know, the same scientists that, that discovered that mycinor's plexus, that's going to be in your digestive system. Okay, coarse aggregates of basophilic substance are known as... Okay, so I'll just tell you right off, that's going to be nissel substance. Nissel substance, so remember we learned nissel substance when we were talking about nerve, right? When we were talking about the cell bodies of neurons. Um, and so what that was, was that kind of blue grainy spottiness that you saw in those cells, right? How there was this kind of graininess in the cell bodies 
of those neurons, that is what we call nissl substance. It's a coarse aggregate of basophilic substance, right? Meaning blue staining, kind of grainy stuff. And so basically what that is, is it's the ribosomes, the polyribosomes, and the rough endoplasmic reticulum within that cell um, because they have a lot of nucleic acids in there, right? Um, ribosomal RNA and stuff like that. Oh gosh. Ribosomal RNA, stuff like that. Um, mRNA um, to help them make proteins and stuff like that. Um, and so they're going to stain more blue. Um, this kind of blue grainy stuff and so basically what that tells us is when we have nissl substance in a cell um, it just tells us that that's a very metabolically active cell that's making a lot of things right it's making a lot of products um, and that that is very characteristic of um, neurons of cell bodies because they're constantly making um, little chemical um, transmission uh, proteins and, and stuff like that to send signals Okay, name a function of the spleen. Um, and so, you know, the overall function of the spleen is it filters blood, right? It filters blood. Um, but some more specific definitions of um, kind of the function of the spleen is it's going to remove old red blood cells, right? And so remember, we talked about that when we talked about the literal cells within the spleen, right? L-I-T-T, -T, literal. Um, and so that kind of makes like a gate. So those are the gatekeepers. Um, of the spleen and so what they do is they make like a, a little barrier so only the fresh and pliable red blood cells can get through that that tight gate of those literal cells um, if they're old right if they're old and they need to be removed they'll get stuck in there and then a macrophage will come in and eat it up right and so that's how we get rid of our old red blood cells another thing that, that those um, literal cells do is it will pit ribosomes from reticulocytes Right? So remember we said reticulocytes are the immature version of erythrocytes. Erythrocytes are our mature red blood cells. Um, and so remember reticulocytes still have ribosomes, they still have mitochondria and stuff like that because they're still making protein and they're, and they're not quite ready. Um, and so in order to help them mature and just be chocked full of protein and no longer have ribosomes and stuff like that, the spleen is going to squeeze it, um, those red blood cells and pit the ribosomes from them so they can become mature erythrocytes. So that's why you see reticulocytes in blood, um, in peripheral blood, is because it still um, hasn't gone through the spleen enough times, through enough cycles, to pit all of those ribosomes out. Okay, so what is this? And then is this a primary or secondary lymphoid organ? Um, so here you can see we've got one big medulla and one big cortex. And within the cortex, we've got these kind of circular looking things, right? These kind of circular looking things. So these are follicles. These are germinal follicles within the cortex, right? These are follicles and then they've got a germinal center, that lighter staining germinal center. Of those follicles and so remember that is very characteristic of a lymph node okay so this is a lymph node and um, lymph nodes do have afferent lymphatics because their um, whole function is to filter lymph right um, so they will have afferent lymphatics all around here they're filtering lymph um, and so that does mean that they are antigen dependent they need the antigens to go through them in order to perform their function to filter that lymph because what they're trying to do is they're trying to take the lymph they're trying to take the white blood cells and they're trying to bring them together right so they can interact so that the white blood cells can see the antigen and they can fight it off um, so that makes it a secondary lymphoid organ, right? It's not just making the white blood cells like your bone marrow and your thymus. It's actually using the white blood cells to fight off antigens. So it's a secondary lymphoid organ. Um, so that is a big thing with the lymphoid system is I do need you guys to be able to identify the organs. Um, tell me if it's primary or secondary. Tell me if it's antigen independent or dependent. Okay. Um, so that's the last one for this Jeopardy review. Um, hopefully this was helpful for you guys, um, and then I will see you guys in the next video. That is where we're going to be covering some pictures that you will see very, um, or you're, you're very likely to see many of them on your midterm, okay? So please be sure to watch that as well. Um, it will be very helpful. I will be pointing out some of the big things I need you guys to identify in those pictures and know about them. Um, but yeah, hopefully that was helpful. I'll see you all in the next video.